Good afternoon, Chamber members. For those of you that I have not yet met, my name is Angie Talent, and I am the broker owner of Summers Sotheby's International Realty, and I am the 2021 chair of the Fairbanks Chamber Board of Directors. I'd like to take a moment, as we do each week, to thank our executive partners whose logos you saw on the screen before we get, began the program today. These businesses provide a rock-solid foundation for the Fairbanks Chamber to be successful throughout the entire year. Their support is not only financial, but they share their business knowledge and experience that help shape and direct the advocacy efforts um, for the interior of Alaska. A full list of our executive partners can be found on our website. I'd also like to thank KeyBank Alaska for sponsoring today's presentation. We will hear more from them later on in the program. And now I'd like to take a moment to welcome Brenna online to help us recognize our new and renewing partners. Hi Angie and hello everyone. Today we have one new member to welcome to our Fairbanks Chamber and that's the UAA Alaska MEP Manufacturing Solution Program. They've been a wonderful partner and we're really excited to have them on board. And to give you a little background about them, I did a little research. So the Alaska MEP Center is backed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as NIST, and they're part of the UAA Business Enterprise Institute, which equips Alaska's manufacturers with the tools and resources necessary to improve the quality, productivity, and competitiveness of our operations. And don't worry, no matter how big or small you are, and no matter what industry you belong to, they would love to come help you. So give them a shout today if you'd like to have them come evaluate your business and see how you can become more productive. We'd also like to thank the following renewing executive partners starting with Spirit of Alaska Federal Credit Union, Alaska Airlines, Everett's Air Cargo, Exclusive Paving and University Ready Mix, GCI, also today's platform sponsor, Sourdough Fuel, Tower Hill Mines Live and Good Gold Project, Denali State Bank, Alieska Pipeline Service Company, Mac Federal Credit Union, Hub International Fairbanks, and Atna Incorporated. Thank you for your continued support and we appreciate your partnership in this year. And also to thank our renewing members, the American Lung Association, Fairbanks Mon Montessori, Edward Jones, Christine Looper, Kate Ripley & Associates, North Star Radiology, Yukon Koi Cook School District, Fairbanks North Star Borough Mayor's Office, Jean Duval Associate Brokers with Remax, Northwind Behavioral Health, Raven Landing Senior Senior Community, Youth Sports Bingo, and Alaska Photo Booth Company. Thank you for renewing your membership and we appreciate all that you do. We'd also like to thank some renewing members that also joined our 110% Club, which means that they gave above and beyond their normal membership dues to help us with their advocacy actions. And today we're welcoming Midnight Sun LLC, Alaska Restaurant Supply, Rice Companies, and Life Water Engineering Company. Thank you. Today's membership moment is just solely a reminder to book those ribbon cuttings now. Right now we have about five ribbon cuttings coming up with some of our most amazing members that are willing to share all these inside sneak peeks into their business. And we'd love to be able to share yours as well. Let us help you celebrate your wins. So we can do anything from ribbon cuttings on planes, hangers, groundbreakings, new location, new facility, new program, you name it, we can help you celebrate it. So make sure you reach out to us today so that we can get you on the schedule so that we can help share your wonderful news with the community. Back to you, Angie. Thanks, Brenna. And now for my uh, board chair report. So nearly all of our advocacy committees are meeting this week to review bills pending in the Alaska legislature, from COVID-19 employer liability to encouraging Congress to enable cruises, and from geo bonds to military spouse professional licenses. Our advocacy committees are keeping an eye on legislation which could impact businesses in the interior. Our Government Relations Committee is also making a special push this year to interact more with our city and our borough governments. If you hear of a proposal at any level of government which could impact businesses in the interior, please be sure to let us know so our committees can keep an eye on it. Our next ribbon cutting is scheduled for March 22nd, and we will be coming to you live from the Fairbanks Children's Museum, where we'll be celebrating their new climbing structure with the museum, Usabelli Cold Mine, and Alaska 529. Join us on the Chamber's Facebook to hear updates on what the future holds for the Fairbanks Children's Museum. It will take place on Monday, March 22nd at 10 a.m. 
And now I'll turn it over to Janelle for her C president and CEO report. Okay, thanks, Angie. A few updates from my end. I am very pleased to announce that Emily Coppinger will be joining us this week as our marketing and communications coordinator. She'll be starting remotely for a few weeks until she joins us in Fairbanks with her husband, who will be stationed at Fort Wainwright. So with degrees in both marketing and entrepreneurship, uh, as well as experience marketing for local organizations in the various places she's lived. We're excited to welcome Emily to the team and to bring her energy into our group. We are still currently seeking one more addition to our team. As you may know, I transitioned from advocacy program manager to president and CEO in January. So we need someone with great communication skills and a passion for Fairbanks businesses to manage the chamber's many advocacy efforts. Candidates may apply through next Monday, March 15th. You can find all the details about the position and how to apply on our website by clicking the Join the Team banner right on the homepage. In other event news, please save the date for our military appreciation celebration set to happen virtually on Tuesday, May 4th at noon. We were not able to congratulate our 2020 honorees last year with a traditional banquet as we usually do, so we will celebrate them in a new way on March 4th. Details on how to attend will be coming very soon. As always, when we have our virtual events, please remember to click on the expo area on the left hand side of your screen to take a look at our sponsor and partner booths. For each engagement, you will receive an entry into a drawing and uh, have the opportunity to win. Our prize today is uh, an interior gas utility Carhartt hat. This is a thick hat. It's a good one for winter in Fairbanks, as well as a, a box of our Captain Jim's Alaska smoked salmon um, that, that was donated to us. So thank you to, for those donations, and we will announce the winner at next week's, next week's luncheon. For more information about any of our events and programs mentioned today, please visit fairbankschamber.org. Back to you, Angie. Thanks, Janelle. So now for our main presentation. So early on in 2020, the Chamber has been proud to par partner with the local he healthcare community to provide a platform to help amplify their message and updates. It is our hope that an informed and local community and business membership will lead to a safe 2021 as we adapt to the challenges and work towards strengthening our economy and our state. So we are pleased to again welcome Dr. Ann Zink and Dr. Laura Bruner for a COVID-19 update for Alaska and the Interior. A little bit about Dr. Ann Zink. She is the Chief Medical Officer for the State of Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. Dr. Zink has 13 years of experience in emergency medicine and joined the Department of Health and Social Services from the Matsu Regional Medical Center, where she served as an emergency department medical director and also on the board of trustees. Dr. Zink is a practicing emergency room physician who is passionate about helping to shape and transform our current healthcare system. In all the work that she does, she strives to create work environments, policies, and practices that are data-driven, foster collaboration, and build system efficiencies that put patients first. Her priorities as CMO include building stronger partnerships between DHSS and Alaska's healthcare providers and providing support statewide and local relevant ways to help establish healthier communities across Alaska. Dr. Zink received her medical degree from the Stanford University School of Medicine and completed her residency at the University of Utah. And now we have Dr. Laura Bruner. She's been a board certified pediatrician at Tana Valley Clinic since 2009 and is the medical director for the pediatrics department and the neonatal intensive care unit at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. Homegrown, Dr. Bruner grew up in Fairbanks and returned home to practice medicine. She, she received her medical degree from the University of Minnesota Medical School and a BS from the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences. She did her internship and residency at the Children's Hospital of Colorado. Dr. Bruner is married with two children and enjoys reading, cooking, and the outdoors of Alaska. So thank you both you doctors for joining us today. 
Great. It's a wonderful to be here. And we also have Coleman Cutchins, uh, one of our lead pharmacists, uh, on with us as well. Unfortunately, I do have to run a bit earlier than I expected. Uh, and so uh, we do have an amazing team at DHSS. Uh, so we thought we would just share a couple slides and kind of talk about where we're at. I loved how you were just talking about the blue ribbon and what you can do. Uh, there is a blue ribbon prize for many of you with vaccines uh, shortly out there. So we're super excited uh, to make COVID a preventable disease and to put this in our rear view mirror and have a totally different spring and fall uh, moving forward. But that's really gonna take a lot of the partnership uh, with you all uh, to get to that point. But man, we're moving fast and we're super excited. So I uh, just wanted to share a couple updates on where we're at. So moving to the next slide. Sorry, I'm usually used to going super fast. So I'll try to uh, give you a heads up before the next slide. So uh, Dr. Bruner uh, is, we're just so fortunate to work with her in so many ways. Uh, the state, I feel like uh, she and I have gotten the opportunity to be on many uh, presentations together. Uh, I get to hear really great stories about uh, what her childhood was like, usually on most of them. So it's been great to have kind of the local partnerships uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. So maybe you guys can share some uh, stories about her later. Uh, here is uh, a few updates about where Fairbanks is at uh, overall. So yeah, since the pandemic, just over 6,000 cases in the Fairbanks region, uh, 15 new cases and a total of 116 people have required hospitalization. And unfortunately, 29 uh, people have passed away from the Fairbanks area from COVID-19. You can see, like most of the rest of the state, kind of a real peak in November, uh, and then coming down afterwards, another kind of peakish, a little bit of a bump there that we saw across many parts of the state associated probably uh, with the holiday and then continuing to see a sharp decline uh, there. And now it's been plateauing like we've been seeing in many parts of the state uh, across the age. You can see that uh, Fairbanks is like the rest of the state and the rest of the country. Um, the predominant group that we see is the 20 to 29 year old age group. Um, we just know that age group does a lot of interacting and working and uh, has kids and uh, are busy. And so they are a little bit higher risk for uh, getting COVID. And so we continue to see that as our most prominent group uh, for COVID uh, infections, not deaths and hospitalizations, but just infections. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at uh, the can go ahead and switch to the next one. In the next slide, we'll see uh, testing, uh, continue to see testing across the state. Testing has never been at such an easy and accessible place uh, in general. So on that last slide, you could see that we have uh, in the Fairbanks region, just about 3% positivity. Uh, we know that we're doing enough testing if we're keeping that under 2%. So we'd love to see uh, kind of an increase in testing. When we're getting to these lower numbers, this is our time to drive out all infection by doing kind of regular asymptomatic testing of people who are exposed on a regular basis. With the end of the emergency order, there's no you know, requirement to test when people travel, but we continue to see travel as a way that cases can really expedite quickly. So we have set up all of the contracts with the airports to continue through June. So it can really, really encourage anyone to access that free testing at the airport um, when they come into the state uh, and then recommend an additional test, you know, five days or so afterwards to make sure you didn't pick it up uh, in the plane and the travel itself. Uh, so the more that we can do to just really have those cases identified earlier, it's much easier to have one person isolate uh, than have their family and their business and their school and everyone else that can then be so quickly impacted. So uh, I kind of think of testing as like the flashlight in the dark. It helps us to see where we're going and identify cases quickly. Uh, no shame uh, in having COVID. It's just a way to identify it so that we can slow it down. It's just an infection and uh, we want to slow the spread as much as we can. So businesses are open and schools are in session and uh, we're moving forward. Next slide, please. This is a new dashboard that we've put up and we continue to move regularly. This is our vaccine monitoring dashboard. And so here you can see census area and you can see coverage by those 65 and above as well as those 16 and above. And so overall how we're doing across the state. About 23% of our population has received at least one dose uh, of vaccine. Um, we have more vaccine and we expect a lot more coming in. And so we are really wanting to move as fast as we can. As we see these variants start to pick up across the country, like the B117 variant, the one that really took down the UK and is spreading quickly throughout uh, the US, uh, is expected to be the predominant uh, variant in the United States by the end of this month. So quite soon, it's really on an exponential rise across uh, the country right now. And our single best protection against it is to slow the spread of the virus. And by doing that, uh, is getting vaccinated. So uh, we are in a race against time and history, uh, really trying to prevent uh, this pandemic from hitting us any more than already has. And the great thing about getting vaccinated is it's a, 
uh, you know, either a one shot or two shot deal, uh, rather than this constant asking of people uh, to kind of mitigate their life in, in different ways. So the more people we can get vaccinated, the less cases we have, uh, the more we can do moving forward. So you can compare yourself uh, to the rest of the state as we move forward uh, and continue to uh, encourage vaccination. On to vaccination a little bit more, a few other details onto the next slide. You can see that we have three different vaccines available in state as of right now. Um, they all work really well against preventing what we really care about, hospitalization and death. And that is the big takeaway. Um, you get a little bit of runny nose or mild symptoms. It doesn't really matter as much as if you're getting really sick and requiring hospitalization and death. So all three look like they do an amazing job. They weren't studied in a head-to-head -head trial against each other. So I always caution people in studying them directly against uh, each other. And when people ask me, well, which one would you get? And I'd say, whichever one is accessible to you first. So whichever one you can do is the one you should get. Um, if you do get one of the ones that require two dosages, so the Pfizer Moderna, we ask you to get the second dose at the same place you get your first dose. So when you have that first appointment, make sure you schedule that second appointment. There's a whole system from the federal government on down uh, that to get those second doses in there. And it can be really complicated to match, match make uh, the second doses if people don't get it at the same place. The Janssen uh, vaccine or also the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, is the same vaccine, but it's uh, only a one dose vaccine. Um, and both the Moderna and Janssen are 18 and above and the Pfizer is 16 and above. And so these are really for adults at this time. There are studies going down to age 12 and some additional studies even younger. But it is so important that we get our adults vaccinated because in that idea of herd immunity, uh, think of like reindeer, think about elephants, think about putting our young uh, in the middle of that herd and protecting them. Uh, we as adults uh, have a chance to really protect our kids. While they don't tend to get as sick, uh, they can still get sick. And we have kids who have significant underlying health conditions as well who can't get vaccinated. So by us getting vaccinated as adults, uh, we help to protect uh, them and uh, excited that we can go down, at least with the Pfizer, down to age 16 uh, to vaccinate. Next slide, please. So looking at how these vaccines specifically work, um, I kind of think of the virus as a choose your own adventure. Uh, so it's a whole bunch of RNA that enters your cell and a whole bunch of different ways that your body might respond to it. Um, and what these vaccines are is they're just kind of like the, the just message to your body on this is what you need to know and this is what you need to uh, be able to do to protect yourself. We're really fortunate in the fact that this virus, SARS-CoV-2, has a really easy target. So the spike protein, those little kind of, the reason it's called a coronavirus is because it looks like a crown, those little spikes coming off of it. Uh, it turns out that that's what we call a soft target. When you develop something against that, it works really well. And so really most of the, the vaccines are directed against that spike. Um, and consistently across all trials, we find uh, that it, it works very well against that. So the Moderna and the uh, Pfizer are essentially a little tiny bit of messenger RNA that tells your body how to make that spike. It's surrounded in a fat particle and then it's put in some salts and sugars. And right before they give it to you, they dilute it in some normal salt water uh, and go ahead and give it to you to be able to make a good immune response. The reason for the second dose, kind of think of it like looking at flashcards, you need to have that long-term memory of it to remember what that looks like. Uh, and so you have that second look and it helps to build your innate immune response or that kind of longer term memory. We do think that these vaccines work really well, even in people who have had COVID-19 before, likely protect you for longer. And some of these variants that we're seeing look like they are likely to cause higher rates of reinfection and the vaccine can help protect against that. So many, many reasons, even if you've had COVID-19 uh, to get you protected. And again, like I mentioned, the big thing that we've looked for is if they make, if uh, the vaccines help prevent you from getting seriously ill or dying and all three of them look to do that really well. Moving on to this next slide is just some more pictures uh, of kind of that spike protein. Uh, and as I mentioned, just being like, I recognize this, I'm set and ready to go. So that when you see that virus, you're able to take it down super fast. You have a whole little uh, you know, army built up uh, for that uh, and set to go. So it's, um, it's pretty a great technology. It's been built on years and years. I mean, it's been hundreds of years that we've been learning about the immune system from you know the initial smallpox uh, on. Uh, and we build on that technology. We build on that understanding. I expect my phone uh, to get faster as technology gets better. Uh, and I expect vaccines to get better as we build on uh, our technology and our understanding of the way that the immune system uh, works. The other big thing that made these come out really quickly was the fact that there was money behind it. So, you know, we just landed on Mars. Uh, when we put our time and effort and energy together, we can do amazing things as humans. And uh, we put our time and effort and energy. Oftentimes for vaccines, you have to fundraise between each and every trial just to get enough people in. 
But now there have been over 100,000 people just in the U.S. in these three trials alone uh, to be able to look at these vaccines, make sure they're safe and efficacious. And even in the U.S. alone, we're reaching almost 800 or 80 million people who have been vaccinated. So huge numbers to be able to look at both safety and efficacy. Um, and even here in Alaska, particularly in our rural areas and amongst our Alaska Native people, we're seeing a much faster drop in cases than we are seeing in other regions because of vaccination. And so we're seeing already here how vaccination is really protecting uh, communities and helping to get back to like living and hugging and doing all the things that we wanna do. So I uh, just wanna move that way as fast as we can. Onto the next slide is a couple of questions that we get regularly. So pregnancy and breastfeeding, we know that women who are pregnant are higher risk for severe complication for COVID-19. And while it wasn't studied specifically in pregnant and breastfeeding women, uh, humans are human and they got pregnant during this trial. And many, many women uh, have chosen to get vaccinated uh, while they're pregnant and breastfeeding. And so uh, there's no evidence that causes any problems with fertility. We do ask you, you know, feel free to talk to your primary care doctor. We encourage questions. Talk to your provider about what this looks like for you. Um, and But uh, pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding may choose to uh, get vaccinated at any point. So um, and again, we've got lots more resources if you have questions, but we get that a lot. On to the next slide, you can see what came out yesterday uh, from the CDC. Um, we knew it was coming, um, but it was great to see um, fully vaccinated uh, guidance and what you can do. So a couple things, uh, if you are fully vaccinated, so that's two weeks either past your second dose for the Pfizer Moderna or two weeks past your one dose for the Jensen, so that's considered fully vaccinated, uh, you can do a lot more stuff. So you don't need to quarantine if you've been exposed uh, to someone with COVID-19. So for those of you who run businesses who may have been impacted by quarantine, quarantine is not fun <laughs> and it is hard on businesses and it's hard on people. Um, and so to be able to have that protection that your employees can keep working, even if someone comes in and is infected during that time, that protection is good. And so you don't have to quarantine. You can gather indoors now without a mask or distancing with other fully vaccinated people. I think I'm still processing this one a little bit, thinking about having dinner with my best friend who I know is fully vaccinated. But I'm like, really? I think I think this is OK now. Uh, I'm super excited uh, what that looks like. Uh, and gathering indoors with unvaccinated people from like one household without masks. So I think this is really like for grandparents and grandchildren. Like we know that kids are really low risk. Um, and so just that one family, that's very different than having a sleepover with a bunch of kids and grandma and grandpa at the same time with a lot more people. So again, it's kind of this risk mitigation looking forward. Um, and that's partially because we're just still watching those variants and we still have a lot of COVID circulating around and until we get more people vaccinated. I kind of think of it again as, you know, we've got the fire door exit. Not everyone's through right now. So we've got to get everyone through that door that can possibly get uh, protected. Uh, and then we can really start to, to just be able to gather in many more ways. Uh, so it's pretty exciting uh, to see that. We still encourage people uh, who have symptoms to get tested. So you can still get COVID if you've been vaccinated. The vaccine will not cause you to test positive. So we still encourage you to test around travel or if you have any other symptoms, it just like physically cannot cause you to be positive. It's just you're more likely to be asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic. And it's good to know so that you won't spread it to others uh, who might be vaccinated. If you head to the next slide, just a few more things that we're still learning uh, is that, you know, there's a lot still to be learned, uh, particularly about these variants and what that looks like. But early data really shows these vaccine works against uh, the variants. It may be slightly less effective. And to put it in perspective, the uh, influenza vaccine is about 40 to 60 percent effective. And so in you know, a Moderna and Pfizer are looking like 95 percent effective. So if it went down to 80, it's still way better than uh, we would have expected. Um, but uh, the more we slow down this virus, the more we slow down this variant. And we just have an opportunity in this state, really above most other states, to vaccinate a lot of people really, really quickly to slow down the spread of these variants and not give this virus uh, a chance. And know that we've got prevention tools. So while not everyone has had a chance to have vaccinated, everyone has an opportunity to mask uh, and to distance uh, that is still there. And, uh, you know, hoping that those things will be able to be eased off in many, many regards. I know many people have already chosen to, uh, but they are really important tools at slowing the spread. And I uh, wonder if Laura and I will still be wearing masks in the hospital for many, many years to come. Just like after the HIV pandemic, we started to wear gloves when we really had a better understanding of bloodborne transmission. Uh, I think we have a much better understanding of respiratory droplets and airborne transmission in many ways and the ways that we can kind of protect, particularly in, in highly vulnerable settings. So moving on to the next slide, you can see who is currently eligible uh, to be vaccinated. I will tell you, this is a really large group. So anyone 55 and above, and then anyone with any underlying health condition or recommended by their primary care provider, 
So that is like, you know, people with asthma, people who smoke, people who are overweight, people who have high blood pressure, all of those people qualify right now to get vaccinated. Anyone who lives in a multi-generational house, so three or more generations or a skipped generation, so grandparents and grandkids, if you're taking anyone over 65 to get vaccinated, you can make an appointment at the same time. Just make sure you make two of them so you both get vaccinated at the same time. If you work in a congregate setting at all or serve a congregate setting. Um, and then the biggest thing is if you're an essential worker. And if you look at the essential worker work list, it's huge. If you work in food, if you work in transportation, if you're a grocery store worker, if you're a waitress, if you run a coffee store, if you run a transportation company, like you are an essential worker. We are all so essential to our businesses staying open. And honestly, when you read that document, pretty much if you're a worker in Alaska, you count uh, as someone right now who can get vaccinated. So I just really uh, encourage people to look, take a look at that. Uh, and we're trying to minimize every barrier we can uh, to get people vaccinated as fast as possible, particularly as we see these variants uh, moving forward. And then underserved communities, those with uh, more than 45% of the homes haven't had water or septic uh, tank. Moving on to the next slide, how to make an appointment um, and how to get help. So um, I will just touch base on this and then I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Bruner who can give you much more specific Fairbanks details because every community is a little bit different. Uh, again, we have a phone number um, and that will be on the next slide, but you can see like here's the Fairbanks Carlson Center appointments uh, that are up uh, and ready to go. And then if you go on to the next slide, uh, we have this phone number for the state, and that is the 907-646-3322. And stand by to help support people. Also, the Aging and Disability Resource Center can help provide transportation for people who need to get it. A lot of language uh, help moving on. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bruner. I do have to run, and I'm so, so sorry uh, that I have to run to another presentation, um, but Dr. Uh, Coleman Cutchins basically can like read my mind most of the times and uh, is here to help answer questions, and so can Dr. Bruner. So I am going to hand it over to Dr. Bruner, and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dr. Zink. That was a rapid fire tour of COVID in March in Alaska in 2021. And I will uh, just touch base on a couple of things related to scheduling an appointment for um, a COVID vaccine here in Fairbanks. So as Dr. Zink said, there's two different ways to schedule an appointment. So this phone number that is on the screen, um, you can call and the team there answers and helps you find spots that are available uh, in town. And then that website uh, that she had a screenshot of on the last slide, which is covidvax.alaska.gov. You can also register there. And Katie, if you'll just go back one slide for a second. Um, the, the part that's circled there in red is really important in Fairbanks. So uh, there are a number of places that are doing COVID vaccine and any and all of them are wonderful options uh, to receive your vaccine or for your employees or businesses to receive their vaccine. The one that's highlighted here is the um, partnership with Public Health and Foundation Health Partners that uh, is doing the vaccines at the Carlson Center. And I just want to take a second and say thank you to Fairbanks. So on Thursday, we did 1,800 and I believe 70 vaccines in one day at the Carlson Center. And that is just a phenomenal feat when you think about that's almost 2% of our population here in Fairbanks in one day. And people came back the next day to do another 800. So Lots of availability, lots of options for people, but you, uh, if you go on the covidvax.alaska.gov website, you click on this link and it will take you uh, to the appointment slots that are available. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the next one, so at the Carlson Center, again, there are multiple sites in town uh, that are doing uh, vaccine. These are a couple of pictures uh, from the Carlson Center, the team that's been here, those of you that uh, recognize Dr. Foote in the corner here, he's been a volunteer giving vaccines there. Uh, we've had great partnership with the volunteers and policing team uh, helping to coordinate all of this uh, and the Carlson Center in the background there. I have to tell you, it's very different from when I've been there for a UAF hockey game or a high school graduation, uh, but really appreciate all the work that's gone into making that happen. And I have had the pleasure of volunteering and giving vaccines there, and it's just been a great Fairbanks experience. So um, please share the links to people that you know that are eligible and interested in vaccination. Next slide, please. So here are some great pictures from uh, last week, uh, wonderful stories around vaccination and uh, partnerships, uh, people bringing grandma, bringing a friend, that sort of thing to make sure everybody has access to vaccine. And then this last slide um, is a couple different resources. So um, we uh, shared a few last time we were here and I'll make sure Katie has the links to these um, 
but these are all available. They're downloadable. They're printable for your vis business. They're just information about vaccines, information about testing here locally in Fairbanks. We try really hard to keep these up to date. Um, as I think everybody knows, as soon as we talk about something related to COVID, a day later, two days later, two hours later, it changes a little bit. So we try really hard to keep these up to date. Um, but they are different materials that are printable or postable uh, in your business and can be shared. And then just wanted to share one additional uh, Fairbanks resource. So um, Tuesday nights, except for this Tuesday, since uh, it is spring break today, as we all know. Um, but otherwise, Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock, there is a Fairbanks local roundtable discussion with questions and answers. Um, and the wonderful DHSS team uh, has partnered with that. And it is a topic every week related to COVID, related to COVID vaccination. And we've had a number of Fairbanks local community members on that Zoom. Uh, and anybody who's interested will make sure um, that the, the team there at the chamber has the link to that. But every Tuesday night at 7 uh, right now is another opportunity to ask questions and talk a little bit more about vaccination. I believe that is the last slide. And then I wanted to just leave a little bit of time um, Coleman, we ran through that at about 100 miles an hour, sort of um, what did we forget and miss or other things that um, we didn't touch on from your standpoint? I don't really have anything to add. I think it was a great overview. Um, no, I don't have anything to add. All right. Uh, perfect. So, uh, Katie, I... I'm not quite sure how to navigate the chat on this one. So um, Janelle, uh, if there are questions, we're happy to run through those. Yeah, we've got a couple that have come in so far. Uh, so I guess we'll start kind of with the virus itself and then talk, there are some questions about vaccines. So I don't know who would be best to answer this, but um, someone did ask, do you know if any of the new variant strains of the viruses have been detected in our state? So I know there have been, but maybe you can talk about which ones we're seeing in Alaska and what the concern is about that. I can, <clears throat> I can answer this. We have detected some of the variants here in Alaska. Um, the, the ones that we have found are the B117. That was the first one we detected. That's the UK variant. Um, again, the UK variant, what we know so far is it, it's um, considerably more transmissible, so it's easier to spread to other people. Um, than the than the original variant, um, and then we've also detected a few now of the P1. And P1 is the Brazilian, known also known as the Brazilian variant. Um, the thing that is a little bit more concerning about the uh, Brazilian variant is um, people who were previously infected with one of the other variants seem a lot more susceptible to infection with the Brazilian variant. Um, now, now some of the good news is. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was actually studied quite extensively in Brazil um, when this variant was quite widespread. So, so it looks like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, which again, we have studied it there and like Dr. Zink said, we, we don't really have any head-to-head -head comparisons and trials for these vaccines, but we do know with Johnson & Johnson that it was quite effective against that Brazilian variant, the P1, that we have detected a few cases here in Alaska. Um, you know. I kind of, anytime we talk about variants, I want to remind everybody, every time a new person is infected, that's a chance for a variant. You know, these these RNA viruses um, in general, I, I kind of joke, they don't have a good spell checker. It's just in their nature um, and they mutate a lot. There's actually been thousands of variants so far of the COVID virus. Many of them don't make a difference. Um, you know, and so far we've just really found these three that make the virus, um, you know, kind of worse from a human infection standpoint, but better from a virus standpoint in terms of it trying to spread. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, Coleman, of the, the virus doesn't mutate by itself. It has to be in a human to mutate. And so one of the ways to sort of help with variants or um, uh, decrease the risk of new variants is by decreasing infection overall. Okay, and I know that uh, the Dr. Zink touched on the new CDC guidelines. I had heard something this morning, actually, someone asking about travel. So I, I don't think that the new CDC guidelines said very much about travel. They talked about, like you said, kind of a grandparent maybe is able to visit with their grandkids if they're fully vaccinated. But um, are there any recommendations at this point about, I think a lot of people are itching to, to you know, just, get a little change of scenery. 
Yeah, I guess I guess I can start. Um, <clears throat> CDC does mention that travel is still risky. Um, it is high risk. You know, you are moving around the country, and there was a really good MMWR a couple of weeks ago about that's how the variants are being spread. You know, that's how the one got from the UK to Alaska and from Brazil to Alaska. Like they wouldn't have gotten here without travel. So, so obviously, um, it's up to you to decide. Um, you know how safe you feel traveling, but travel still is um, a risk factor. We know that. Um, not really any new guidance out from the CDC around travel. Um, we still do recommend the, the CDC does still recommend that people get tested uh, prior to and post travel. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Bruner, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think we all have a little bit of spring fever uh, in this moment. Uh, and I think the hard part is right now we really are, like Dr. Zing said, in that race to vaccinate and try and get our vaccine rate up before our variant rate takes off. Um, and the the guidance from the CDC yesterday did specifically say travel remains a high risk uh, activity. Okay. Um, what, what, what I'm hearing you say is that my husband is going to be vaccinated, gets to go to Hawaii, and I don't. So that's a real bummer. <laughs> uh, so uh, talking about vaccines, uh, someone did put in the chat that the Carlson Center system was awesome. So that's just an endorsement that I've, I've definitely heard that from some other people too, that they felt like that was the, the way that people were brought through the process and the information that was given, everything was really successful. So kudos to everyone who's been involved with that. Um, let's see now. I, so I'll, I'll give you a question with someone kind of asked almost for verbatim to me, but I'm curious to hear what your answer is to this. Uh, so someone said, we don't really know what the long-term effects of the vaccines are at this point, because we don't have a long-term, we don't have any long-term studies. The virus just hasn't been around that long and the vaccines certainly haven't. So are you concerned at all about the long-term effects of the vaccine? I mean, I know I, my response was, I'm much more concerned about the long-term effects of the virus than of the vaccines, but I'm curious what your answers would be to that. So I, I can start and <clears throat> I want to a lot of people this isn't kind of common knowledge but you know these mRNA vaccines have actually been under development for for decades um, and and we've tried you know they tried with influenza they tried with uh, Zika they tried with Ebola and the biggest problem up until this point was they couldn't make them hang around long enough they just weren't stable if you look at um, mRNA in our body you know it's not meant to be hung around very long our body like gets rid of it very quickly, it metabolizes it and it breaks it down. And also vaccines in general aren't made to hang around very long. You know, I will, I will remind everyone that, that we've never had a, um, you know, so far a um, evidence-based long-term adverse event of a vaccine. You know, they just, I mean, vaccines are the safest medications that we give to a whole lot of people every year. You know, long-term in terms of vaccine, we think about it as a month or two, um, but they just, they're not things that are meant to hang out in our body. You know, like, like Dr. Zink said, they go into our body, they teach our body how to respond to something and they're gone. Um, so it's not like the type of medications that you take every day or weekly or monthly or give at a regular interval, you know, in the, in the clinical pharmacy world, we, we talk about, you know, accumulation and metabolic, you know, and metabolization, like these drugs don't accumulate, they're given and they go away. So, um, in terms of, you know, long-term effects. Um, I also kind of am reminding people now, you know, phase three clinical trials are generally like tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of people. And that's where we see kind of common side effects, you know, things like pain and injection site, you know, kind of the feeling a little bit crummy for a day, you know, fever afterwards, signs that your immune system is working. But then even after vaccines or any drug for that matter, when they go to market, they're in technically phase four trials. So right now these vaccines and a lot of other drugs that people take every day are technically in a phase four clinical trial. Um, that's where rare side effects show up. You know, now we're in the kind of, I think 70 or 80 million people have received at least one dose of the vaccine around our country. So, so for me, I mean, again, kind of anything can happen, but I'm very, I'm pretty confident we're not going to see a long-term adverse event because it would have shown up by now. And I'm much more concerned with the adverse events that we have well-documented with kind of this post-acute or long COVID syndrome. Dr. Brenner, do you have anything to add to that? 
Yeah, um, Janelle, I would just echo that. So while yes, we can't tell you, here's the five years worth of data on this vaccine, because it hasn't been around for five years. Because when I think about a year ago, I was just starting to hear about what COVID was. So having that perspective, I think is really um, important. that We don't have years of data on these vaccines, but when we look at what we know about vaccines, um, like Coleman said, really the goal of a vaccine is to teach your immune system how to take care of something and then go away. So the vaccine doesn't hang around those studies were really designed to look at what happens in the two months after vaccination, because that's the highest likelihood of a time when you're going to have a side effect from a vaccine. And that's different from sort of a, um, a vaccine reaction. So what we expect to happen after you get a vaccine is your immune system to work. So you have this immune response in the couple of days after a vaccine. And that's that sore arm, achy, tired, fever. That's your immune system working. That's what we want to happen. And we certainly are seeing that um, with vaccination, which is a good thing. Okay, this is really helpful for me because people ask me questions about it. And I'm like, all right, now I got some good answers. Um, so one question that did come up in the chat, I might paraphrase just a little bit, is um, there you know, depending on who you listen to or who you talk to, uh, some people are very focused on, you know, it's not over yet, we need to still be careful, um, you know, talking about the variants and that type of thing. And the question is sort of focused on, well, why are we not celebrating the successes more? Um, you know, is there some concern about keeping people afraid? Yeah, good, good question. So I think there's a couple things. I think um, the biggest piece of it is we still have 80% of our community that is not vaccinated. So for the 20% that's vaccinated, oh my gosh, yes, so exciting. You, as Dr. Zink said, can go to your vaccinated friend's house and have dinner without a mask for the first time in so long. I think that is a huge win and a huge celebration. And I think it is time that we spend some time looking at the positive and talking about how amazing and how effective these vaccines are. But we have 80% of our community that's not vaccinated today in Fairbanks. And so we do have a lot of work to do to help bring our community and our family members um, to a place where they are both able to receive the vaccine and comfortable to get the vaccine. And that's going to be the biggest win for us uh, in the long run is really focusing on how do we have this tool so we can make COVID, severe COVID, a preventable disease. Because if it's a cold, great. I love that. I can handle a cold. Um, and I think we all really look forward to that time. So I agree we need to celebrate the successes. Um, but in that, we got 80% uh, of our Fairbanks community that we need to partner with. Coleman, what would you add to that? Yeah, I fully agree with that. I mean, you know, if you would have asked me, you know, six months ago um, about vaccine, I would have said, well, I'm hopeful that it's 50 or 60 percent effective. So I think a massive win is that we have vaccines that are in the kind of 95 percent effective. You know, just to put it into perspective, I mean, flu vaccines about 50 percent effective. You know, kind of if you look at the average over a few year period, we have good years and bad years for match. So, I mean, it's a huge positive that we have such effective vaccine. Now, that being said, um, you know, the, the, the calculations vary a little bit, but the point that we want to see um, from a public health kind of population standpoint is about 80% of the community being vaccinated before we reach kind of that herd immunity threshold. Um, so, so kind of flip it, you know, you're at 20 now, 80 not, you need to be at 80 vaccinated and 20 not. Um, that being said, you know, in, until we really get close to that or at that point, we're still going to see community spread. You know, we, we still, there is evidence now, you know, I, I remind people that, um, you know, 95% effective still means one in 20 people got, um, you know, symptomatic disease, let alone it was mild. Um, but the problem is when we have some people that are vaccinated in the community and some people that are not, um, you know, the, the vaccinated people, that one in 20 can still spread it to someone who's not. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's huge positive hope on the horizon. I'm, I'm, I'm more, way more hopeful now than I was, you know, mid, uh, you know, end of November before we knew about these vaccines. Um, but it's, it's really what's going to move us, you know, kind of out of this and making it more like, you know, individual cases versus it affecting the whole community. All right, well, um, if there was one last question that popped into the chat and then I think we'll have to wrap it up to do some of our end materials here, but someone did ask, should I have vaccinated my 18 year old? I assumed she would have to wait. 
Yeah, that's a great uh, question. So as a pediatrician, I love the idea of talking about vaccinating teenagers. Um, so uh, depends on your 18 year old um, that uh, as Dr. Zink went over those criteria um, as it stands today. And again, this is an ever moving target, but as it stands today, um, teenagers down to the age of 16 that have a risk factor for severe COVID. So that was um, kind of Dr. Zink gave a couple of examples, asthma, um, obesity, diabetes, uh, or have a risk factor for severe COVID after talking with their provider uh, certainly are eligible to receive the vaccine. So um, 18 could receive any of the three brands, so Moderna, Pfizer, or Johnson & Johnson. Um, 16 to 18, only the Pfizer brand. So you'd want to sign up on a day that uh, talked about having Pfizer on it on that website. But certainly down to age 16 with a risk factor can sign up for the vaccine. Or if they bring in somebody over the age of 65 and schedule their appointment uh, as well. I'll add to that. We, we, I expect that criteria are going to open up more um, any day, you know, I, I think. So even asking the question about, you know, the 16 or 18 year old without risk factors, I would personally expect very soon, you know, within the next month, them to be able to be eligible even without risk factors. Um, the other thing I, I expect to see, my own crystal ball is telling me um, before, you know, before next before fall next is that I believe 12 and up will, will be indicated. I mean, kids 12 and up are being up, have been in the studies for, for quite a while now. So I think that's on the horizon. That also gives me hope. Um, but honestly, I think for kids under 12, it's going to be a while. Um, you know, I, I would say probably, possibly even a year. So I think that being said, it's going to be more important to, you know, try to get our kids vaccinated. I will tell you, my two teenagers who are not 16 yet, as soon as they're indicated, I'll, I'll, I will get them vaccinated. Okay, well, I definitely know there are a lot of our members who are itching to get back to in person meetings and uh, ready to step away from their computers at least a couple of hours a day. So I think we're all excited to, to get to that point as well. We're all eligible. Um, well, I did want to say thank you so much to Dr. Bruner. Was it Dr. Cutchins? I did, we didn't have you in our script, so I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so thank you to both of you. Thanks to Dr. Zink for all the information and for giving us this update, because I think people really are hungry for the information and, and like I said, hungry to get back to uh, some of the things that we've been missing. So thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and we have a couple more things before we send everyone off for the day. So um, after the, took care of the questions. So I would now like to invite Lori McCaffrey, president of commercial banking and sales leader, president and commercial banking sales leader, excuse me, of Key Bank Alaska to the screen for a sponsor spotlight. Okay, so it looks like she is having some technical difficulties. So we are just going to say thank you so much to KeyBank for KeyBank Alaska specifically for sponsoring today's update and for um, being involved. We will next go to uh, we have a video on behalf of Interior Gas Utility. It's been make they have been making great strides in expanding the availability of natural gas to in, to Interior Alaska. And they just celebrated the opening of their North Pole facility, and we were there for that. It was pretty exciting and cold, but also exciting. Energy touches all aspects of life in the interior, from powering our appliances to heating our community. From keeping you warm and safe during the winter months to powering your grill for get-togethers under the midnight sun. Alaskans need reliable energy, and natural gas is our answer to bring peace of mind and to power our lives. Every day, IGU transports chilled natural gas from the Cook Inlet via truck to the interior to satisfy our mission. Provide low-cost, clean-burning natural gas to the most people in the Fairbanks North Star Borough as soon as possible and it's finally arriving in North Pole. Nestled in the heart of the interior, cold temperatures bring forward their own unique challenges. Using natural gas to power the city of North Pole has huge potential to help improve the air quality. So I'm very eager to be a utility customer, to get connected to natural gas, 
uh, and convert my home from propane, which we've been running on for about three years now, uh, to the gas system. It's, it's just a great feeling. The employees are the ones that really you know, we need to celebrate, and they, they, need, they get a, a great shout out on, on doing a super good job of pulling, doing all their normal, keeping the gas flowing every day, but also growing us and, and helping us move towards this long-term future. I'm fortunate enough to be one of the first customers to connect to the system, but the entire system in phase one uh, has been energized, which means that customers can start connecting immediately. Most likely what that means is in this upcoming construction season is when we'll see a lot of those customers come on, but there's availability. People should be coming down and signing up today to get hooked up to gas this next summer. When you need it, natural gas is there for you and your family. We are Interior Gas Utility. We are your neighbors. We are your friends. We are dedicated to powering our community. After a lot of hard work, natural gas is finally here and ready to service the community of North Pole. We are IGU and we are here for you. Okay. Thank you again to the, the doctors for sharing their update today. Thank you to Key Bank Alaska for your support of this presentation. And thanks to Interior Gas Utility for expanding your services to our community. Thanks as well to our membership and community members who have tuned in today. Lots of thanks to go around today. We hope to see you next week when we will be joined by Peggy Gage to learn how to get your business noticed online with Google Tools. You can click on the link in the chat, which we will be posting for your free ticket and let us know how you plan to attend. You can also find that link at any time on our website under weekly business presentations. Thank you, Fairbanks, and we will see you next Tuesday.